Hello, this is Melissa, and today is the 21st of July, 2024. I want to let you know that next Saturday, the 27th of July at 7 p.m., I believe it's British Standard Time, Greg will be leading the discussion and the Telegram Book Club site for Tragedy and Hope. And he will be covering chapters 9 and 10. Chapter 9 is Germany, from Kaiser to Hitler, 1913 to 1945. And chapter 10 is Britain, the background to appeasement, 1900 to 1939. And I am looking forward to participating in that discussion. And I hope that as many of you as would like to be there, get over there. You can check the information that I put up on this video and also on the website so that you can find your time zone and figure out what time to be there. And I will also make a little video to accompany this and put it up hopefully by the end of this month, you know, a few days after the conversation. So looking forward to that conversation. The Redux that I chose to go up today, this will be Redux number 170. And it is from August 13, 2017. O oh, brave new world, are we surprised? Governments, nations, armies, all privatized. I hearken back to what I will call the event that occurred in the U.S. a week ago. And I think that the event is a good way of describing it. I don't know what happened. I've watched hours and hours and hours of video and read articles and just for curiosity's sake explored many different points of view from the right, from the left, from the middle of the road. And I will also say right up front that I don't really think it makes any difference what happened at that event. But more on that later. I probably wouldn't have gotten into watching the Republican National Convention because I have never in my life watched any convention footage or any political debate. And in the whole time that I was with Alan, we watched all kinds of things, looked at stacks of information, documentaries, clips, you name it. And we never watched a convention or a debate. It just it was not interesting. And so because of this event and the mood in the States and being around some people who were invested in this with different points of view, I thought, well, let's investigate this. What really spurred me on, I was with my Aunt Betty and her friend, and this was, I think, maybe after the first night of the convention. And they were talking about how lovely J.D. Vance's wife looked. She was just very simple in her presentation, not one piece of jewelry, very little makeup. Um, oh, and did you know she's a vegetarian? That's so healthy. And, I, and she's gotten J.D. to be a vegetarian, too. And they would speak just as glowingly of Melania on a different night, you know, oh, how pretty she looked in that, you know, that was a Christian Dior suit. And it reminded me, Alan would talk about when Gorbachev, after, you know, the fall, <laughs> the, the end of communism, they brought Gorbachev and his wife over to tour around the United States. And he said, you know, that serious journalists were interested in the color of lipstick that Mrs. Gorbachev was wearing, and this kind of thing got coverage. So I thought, well, you know, I've never seen one of these. I am going to go and check it out. But just at a glance, before I was watching any of the videos, I could see it just seemed like such a, a carnival, a circus. 
And I knew, of course, you know, brass bands and parades and all of that, that it would have that element to it. But I thought, before I start to watch any of this coverage, let me just go back and watch some old conventions. And so I found footage from the 1932 Republican Convention and the 1936 Republican Convention and 1972, that was with Richard Nixon. And one interesting thing about that is you had all of the protesters outside yelling, stop the killing, stop the bombing, and and there was a heightened sense of security, and they talked to different people who were fearful of how they were going to get out of the convention and make their way through this unruly mob when it was over. So throughout, even back in 1932, there was always this, you know, the red, white, and blue banners and balloons and big placards. That's the convention is supposedly for counting and swaying the votes, you know, doing your bit of PR so that you get your delegates to vote your way. That is the purpose of it. And then at the end, they choose the nominee. What I was struck by, though, was that in spite of the the balloons and the brass band feeling of it, and the reason why I even went on that journey is because I've remember being struck by things like Aldous Huxley's speech at Berkeley. When you hear the questions that they are fielding, there's just a seriousness there in the in the audience that is has been lacking. This has been sort of programmed out of us so that everything now is just it's it's almost pure entertainment. And again, when Yuri Bezmenov le- lectured to a group of young people, students, well, actually people of all ages, and this was back in the 80s, again, I was struck by the the seriousness of his audience, the the consideration that they gave their questions, the their attire, um, just to see the passage of time and the differences where we are today. But overall, the carnival atmosphere is, you know, this is by design. This is what it is supposed to be, a big party. So armed with all of this, I went to watch some of the coverage. And I had to get up to speed and see because I, I only got in on the final night of the convention so I watched some little clips here and there and I I saw that you know the fiery speeches and working people up and of course a big thing that was discussed was the event this shooting event that had occurred the weekend before and I had been watching right since the beginning of the event lots and lots of coverage again from all different points of view. So the initial response is shock and dismay but almost immediately literally within half an hour the theories and the conspiracies begin to be promoted. Those who were conservative for Trump were in disbelief, utter disbelief, that the Secret Service could allow so many mistakes to occur. They were warned, the police said, somebody saw him on the roof, they were pointing him out. And then immediately the defensive coverage occurs so that people go into great detail. Okay, the Secret Service were positioned here and they were positioned there. And look, neither one could see the person on the roof because there's a tree in the way. And things are quite implausible because, of course, you know, the the Secret Service has days to prepare for these events and that is their job is to completely survey the area to make sure that there is nothing that is beyond their scope. But 
I don't like to get caught up in the is it real, did it happen, was it staged, uh, were, was there more than one shoe, be, be, because it doesn't matter. And so in looking for the redux, oh brave new world, are we surprised? Governments, nations, armies, all privatized. I chose this because Alan starts off with his wisdom, let's just call it common sense, but you know, his, his deep understanding of a system and how it works. And he said, you've got different ways. You see, he wants to take a look at different ways of seeing history. You've got the accidental view, and that's the view in which you believe everything that you've been told, all of your indoctrination. And then there is the view that things are planned. There are little conspiracies that people know about. There's a... a he, he outlines basically four different ways. The fourth being those who actually see it, but who are not in on the planning, but they see this happening. And they've got the hardest time of all trying to convey this to other people. And Alan said, as I've said many times, I've come out and said this, that when I first started, I didn't come out to change anything in any big drastic way because I was completely aware of this system we call reality, which is incredibly huge. And there's thousands of think tanks working on every aspect of our existence, and you think you're going to change all of that just by pointing it out. It doesn't matter what you point out. People go along with decisions according to whom they trust or to who understands their psychology better. That's why fear and terror is a great tool. It's always been used. When I read that part about, you know, and, and listened to him say, it's incredibly huge with thousands of think tanks. I thought back to the book that I read recently, Foundations, Their Power and Influence. And it is a good book. I highly recommend but I'm just going to mention a couple of things here. Wormser is talking about one group, a group, by the way, this book was written in 1957, and he is discussing a group that is still very much on the go in social engineering called the Social Science Research Council. And in its 1928 Got that? 1928, 1929 report. It disclosed one of its purposes. A sounder empirical method of research had to be achieved in political science if it were to assist in the development of a scientific political control. Now, Wormser says, he writes, political control is thus to be left in the hands of the elite the, quote, social engineers. What the people want is not necessarily good for them. They are not competent to decide. The Führers must decide it for them so that we can have a scientifically based and intelligent society. And he goes on at great length and quotes very many sources for this, all of the things that were being investigated by the Reese Committee at this time. He, he writes, the foundation-supported concept of, quote, social engineering with its political implications was castigated by Professor Sauer in these words. Research programs that are set up in terms of social goals, and it is assumed that professional training provides the deep insight needed, having set up schools for the training of profits it gratifies us to hear that the great task of social science is to remake the world. Alan said, it's not just a matter of telling people, but there are those who see it from an early age and they turn on themselves often. 
everything's wrong. They know it's wrong, and they turn on themselves. And I came out to try to stop that from happening. It's very self-destructive because you don't know all the facts at the time. You just know it's all wrong. And the things that you can see are wrong. And the few things that you can point out to other people, it's a stunning effect to realize that most folk don't care what's happening or the injustices, etc. And that struck me because I've had a lot of feedback and a lot of interaction with people and a lot of surveying what is out there to discuss this. What mistakes did the Secret Service make? Who knew what when? From the point of view of those many, not all, but many on the left, and I'm talking general populace interviewed man on the street, they believe that Trump was in on it. Everything is a big lie. They hate him. It's, you know, the never Trumpers, the the Trump, I think they call it Trump derangement syndrome, something like that. They, the loathing of this man is so intense that, of course, he, Trump himself, was in on this. It's a completely staged event so that he could achieve the desired outcome, which is being seen as a holy man, touched by God. Uh, the hand of God was upon him. He was saved. And there are those in the, you know, deep into the conspiracy rabbit holes, whether they are for or against Trump or neutral or whatever, who believe the same thing. And all I want to say about this is, First of all, I don't know, and I don't have too much time and interest in diving deep, deep, deep into this because I don't know and I'll never know. I have my reactions. I can just say, as other people pointed out, um, I think somebody brought it to my attention, Henrik Palmgren might have been the first to say, well, he got the Iwo Jima photograph, and that he did. And there were others who said he was down there on the ground saying, I can't find my shoe. I have to get my shoe. I have to find my shoe, which is some kind of Masonic password, you know, that his shoe was still on his foot, but he was saying, I have to have my shoe. Um, you know, people talk about Hollywood squib blood and, uh, you know, it's, uh, a lot was achieved that was favorable for conveying a certain image out of this crisis is that what happened I don't know someone wrote to me that whatever was going on this was was this not a defining moment for America for the United States and I don't know I think we have our defining moments all of the time individually and collectively and I think an interesting defining a series of defining moments has led us to a place where the performers at the Republican National Convention, you know, some tired, old, barely known, uh, foul mouthed rap singer was there to give her support. A couple of wrestlers, it, 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 a real freak show, in other words, with decent people who, like other decent people down through time, believe everything that they've been told and they believe that it is real. And I was watching the, the chat. I couldn't believe the speed with which the chat window flies by when they're live streaming the convention, but 
you had a bit of this and a bit of that and how beautiful the Trump family was you know they're they just are so beautiful there and to me when I was watching them I thought of some eugenics advertising when the eugenics pre-world war ii were such a big part of american culture and you had the you know the ideal american family and i thought it's interesting that the ideal american family now is stinking rich so we can talk about her fifty eight thousand dollar jacket that she wore when she was in paris and the you know this designer that you know and okay they're billionaires they can afford it but it's this is the ideal family kind of plastic overly made up people but nothing has really changed in in 1936 when Alf Landon was chosen as the Republican nominee Do, do any of you remember Alf Landon that's another point, too. These people go into the rubbish bin of history, but we love them like gods while they are here. He lost to the incumbent FDR. One little interesting thing, though, that I read when looking that up was that the Republicans were saying, we're, we're against the New Deal. We're against New Deal economics and New Deal policies, and so vote for us. We're not going to do this. But at a closer look of the actual platform, the Republicans were, in fact, in support of a great many of the programs that we have come to look back on in history as the New Deal. So we're always looking at a unified front by those elite, foundation-supported elite, who are really running the show, including the puppet show that we call politics. But in looking at some footage of that 1936 convention and some behind-the-scenes stuff, there they were showing Alf Landon at home with his lovely family, his wife and his children. And the father-in-law, I guess, who lived with them. And there's a harp in the middle of the living room because every average American family in 1936 had a harp in their living room. You see, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's a, the eugenics ideal family. But... On the flip side of that, we get that something else. And this year, that something else is J.D. Vance. So I want to share a few things. I don't want to take up too, too much time here. But I'm going to mention two articles that I will link to. And the first is from a substack, a writer I've run across a couple of times before by the name of Miri AF and she has a site called Miri's Massive Missives and it is long so I will post it and you can read the entire thing but she writes Donald Trump that is the seasoned actor Donald Trump with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame has announced his running mate and it is none other than the celebrated Hollywood darling James David J.D. Vance We all already know who Mr. Vance is because the star-studded Hollywood production Hillbilly Elegy, based on his eponymous memoir, has been top ten Netflix fodder for months. She brings you up to speed, just in case you don't know. I'll just mention here that that film was directed by Hollywood royalty. That's Ron Howard. So things like this don't just happen we're watching a star being made. So she said, so let's just repeat that. The actor, Donald Trump, has appointed the film writer, J.D. Vance, as his vice president. I have again and again drawn attention to the extraordinarily large number of high-profile political figures who have a background in the performative arts, either as actors themselves or as drama teachers, and invited people to consider that when professional purveyors of theatrical art 
quote, become politicians, they are, in fact, simply moving into another acting role. They are playing parts and reading scripts handed down to them by directors and producers as part of an elaborate global stage show. The phrase, politics is show business for ugly people, is telling us that high-profile, big-name politics is every bit as much of a fictitious dramatic production as Hollywood movies are. Now, this is lengthy. It's well-written. There are a few things in here that I don't necessarily see eye to eye with her on, but overall it is a good article and she's getting to the point. Who staked the millions and millions of dollars for J.D. Vance's book, which she wrote about 13 years ago or so? That was none other than Peter Thiel. Who has backed him with a, a PAC financing what they call these political action, I think it's political action committee, for $15 million. That is Peter Thiel. So Vance is in the role, in a way, of Bill Clinton, the hillbilly. His mother doesn't, maybe he doesn't know who his father is. I'm not clear on that because she had several different husbands, or maybe he does know who the father of, uh, I don't know. I didn't want to dive too deep into that, but she was a drug addict. He made good. He went to Yale. That's where he met Peter Thiel, who came to lecture. He met his wife, who is uh, Indian American. It's hard to find these things out, but when you look at her parents and her background and the fact that she was promoted by Bill and Melinda Gates to go to either Oxford or Cambridge for a program, I'm not sure, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, or does she come from the Brahmin class? Uh, who, who knows? These, Like I say, these things are hard to find out. But J.D. Vance himself beats up a little bit on the poor people. In other words, he's poor boy made good, and if he can do it, anybody else can. And if they don't, perhaps they're lazy. These are some things that he states in his book. This writer, Miri, says, Vance is simply recapturing the ancient feudal belief, beloved of predator classes everywhere, that anyone poor, read, making less than 100000 a year, is lazy, feckless, stupid, and probably addicted to something, styling himself as an anti-opioid crusader, Vance, in fact, worked for a law firm who lobbied for Purdue Pharma, producer of so-called hillbilly heroin, OxyContin. OxyContin is estimated to have killed over 200,000 people. I, I would say it's much more than that. With Vance's home state of Ohio having one of the highest rates of opioid overdose deaths. Just some a, a little aside here. When I was going through old conventions, I came upon footage from the 1988 Republican convention when Ronald Reagan, an actor, was concluding his two terms as President of the United States and stepping away from an active involvement in the Republican Party. And his wife, Nancy, was set to speak about her time in the White House and her gratitude to the American people and so forth. And the actor, Tom Selleck, introduced her. This is 1988. 36 years ago and he, evidently he had been part of her just say no to drugs campaign as an actor he was participating in that and he was very gracious and praised her work in bringing attention to the drug crisis in America and I thought a couple of things First, an actor introducing an actress who is the wife of an actor. And the second thing that I thought was the drug, just say no to drugs. There was a crisis, and that was her, All the, the first ladies always have their task that they do. I think 
the name of Melania's was Be Best. I don't know what that means, but, you know, Nancy's was Just Say No to Drugs. And we saw the egg in the frying pan. And this is your brain on drugs. And yet here we are in this country where drugs flood in from all directions. Um, we hear a lot from our politicians about how we have to close down the borders because they're flooding in from the southern border and this is true and there is an opioid crisis there's a fentanyl crisis there's a heroin crisis what I'm saying is that sadly politics doesn't work it's just a show it's over and over every year and the dissent and you'll see this in your own countries, wherever you are. Lots of rhetoric about keeping Ireland for the Irish. You know, lots of rhetoric, politicians who are going to do something about the crisis that we're in. But this is a global agenda. And so no matter what the politicians say, and no matter how much time and energy you invest in it, the, the agenda carries forward down through time so I just wanted to add that in there because show theater actors it goes on to talk about Peter Thiel and the CIA connection um, she writes it's key to note that if you read between the lines there is in fact very little difference between Vance's rhetoric about the feckless, spendthrift, drunk, and drugged inhabitants of rural America and Yuval Noah Harari's remarks about the so-called useless class, people who are no longer needed as workers by the global machine, and so sink into apathy and substance abuse. Both Vance and Harari coalesce on an ultimate point, that more and more ordinary people are becoming useless, living meaningless lives made bearable only by substances and distractions. Harari has concluded the best case scenario for the future of many ordinary people is drugs and computer games. Alan didn't take on advertisers and or sponsors or anything like that because he wanted the freedom to say what was what but there was one thing, there were a few articles about Peter Thiel over the years that crossed his desk. He was careful in the way that he conveyed this because he did use PayPal in order to process donations and orders. So he'd say, well, you know, let me, let, I, I'm just going to have a bit of caution there. Well, three years ago, almost to this day, I believe it was yesterday, but three years ago, PayPal uh, ceased doing business with me. There was no uh, chance to appeal. It was just done because they said that the content was against their community guidelines policy. And... This happened to me four months after Alan passed away. It was a very difficult obstacle to overcome. It made things challenging, to say the least, for quite some time as I was in the process of moving out of Canada. I did notice that on the exact same day that this occurred to me, I got, I got that letter I was paying attention to some things in the alternative world and I found out that a site called American Vagabond, I don't know too much about the guy who runs that, but at that time in 2021, Whitney Webb of Unlimited Hangout, the journalist Whitney Webb, was associated with American Vagabond and they received the exact same letter. A few I had noticed that a few weeks before I got that, there were a few other so-called truthers that were cut off. So this was a thing that PayPal was doing. Anyway, I, I say that simply because having no longer an association with PayPal, I don't mind talking about Peter Thiel. And 
I am going to, I have mentioned a couple of articles recently that were on Whitney website. One she wrote, one was written by someone else. And I'm going to bring to your attention an article that she just posted. Again, very long, and so I won't be reading it all. She just posted this on the 18th of July. The man behind Trump's VP pick. It's worse than you think. While J.D. Vance has his own controversies, his close connection to billionaire Peter Thiel, who is poised to have unprecedented influence in a new Trump administration, should deeply unsettle every American who cares about freedom, privacy, and reigning in the surveillance state. Whenever I see the word privacy, I always think of Alan, and I want to say privacy, but I'm an American. So I'll read you just a few things here. After the recent revelation that Donald Trump has selected J.D. Vance as his vice president, public attention not only turned toward Vance, but also to the billionaire Peter Thiel. Vance has been one of several prominent Thiel protégés whose profile has risen in recent years, including Open um, AI's Sam Altman and Anderil's Palmer Lucky. Now, she outlines some interesting things here, some connections to Google CEO Eric Schmidt. Um, he, it, this is a fascinating article simply because she's doing a deep, deep investigation into things that Alan talked about years ago, total information awareness, DARPA programs, basically. I'll just cut to the chase. She is investigating DARPA programs that were said to be disbanded, and she's showing a timeline, particularly with total information awareness and Peter Thiel's Palantir. And in the last month, I've linked to the Palantir articles a couple of times. It's very fascinating. What you get when you listen to Alan's talk that I'm going to post today, and again, here he says, governments, nations, armies, all privatized. This is how it is. This is, this is the new war. So when people talk about a civil war, a coming civil war. I'm also reminded of something in Carl Quigley's Tragedy and Hope, and we have not gotten there in book club. This is not page 1200, so it's the very end of the book. And I'll just read a little bit. The Unfolding of Time. The political conditions of the latter half of the 20th century will continue to be dominated by the weapons situation. For while politics consists of much more than weapons, the nature, organization, and control of weapons is the most significant of the numerous factors that determine what happens in political life. Surely weapons will continue to be expensive and complex. This means they will increasingly be the tools of professionalized, if not mercenary, forces. All of past history shows that the shift from a mass army of citizen soldiers to a smaller army of professional fighters leads in the long run to a decline in, of democracy. When weapons are cheap and easy to obtain and to use, almost any man may obtain them. And the organized structure of the society, such as the state, can obtain no better weapons than the ordinary industrious private citizen. This very rare historical condition existed about 1880, but is now only a dim memory, since the weapons obtainable by the state today are far beyond the pocketbook understanding or competence of the ordinary citizen. When weapons are of the amateur type of 1880, as they were in Greece in the 5th century BC, they are widely possessed by citizens power is similarly dispersed and no minority can compel the majority to yield to its will. With such an amateur weapons system, if other conditions are not totally unfavorable, we are likely to find a majority rule and a relatively democratic political system. 
but on the contrary, when a period can be dominated by complex and expensive weapons that only a few persons can afford to possess or can learn to use, we have a situation where the minority who control such specialist weapons can dominate the majority who lack them. In such a society, sooner or later, an authoritarian political system that reflects the inequality in control of weapons will be established. Okay? An authoritarian political system that reflects the inequality in control of weapons will be established. So the, that section, is it goes on a bit there, and those of you who are reading Tragedy and Hope can go there. It's my copy. It's about 1,200, The Unfolding of Time. But this is interesting because the way I see it is not only have we been run by foundations and foundation money for about a hundred years now who have done an excellent job of social engineering, but the military industrial complex, oh yes, they still make tanks and missiles and you know bullets and bombs and so forth and so on. But I believe that um, I, I kind of take James, Dr. James Giordano at his word when he says that the battlefield is currently the mind. And I think that total surveillance, total information awareness, the kind of data mining that Peter Thiel and, uh, you know, if you want to be creeped out, just look into the CEO of Palantir. And I'll post a couple of articles on him. Every time I, I forget him, I always say Peter Thiel, Peter Thiel. But the guy who's actually running the show by the name of Alex Karp, I, I, I just always feel like I need to, you know, wash my hands and disinfect and, you know, spray cleaner in my eyeballs when I look into him. What a, what a creep. So uh, that is Palantir. So finally, wrapping it up, as Alan said in this talk, we're, we're in a system that cannot be saved. So I, I think individuals can be pulled out of this. Individuals can put their uh, energy in a different direction, and that's a good thing, and that's what Alan was about. But the shooter's position... Uh, whether or not the shooter is for real, if did the Secret Service bungle, were they in on it? Uh, the the this the whole touched by the hand of God. I I'm just not that interested. To me, this is a major distraction, and we are fed so many major distractions all of the time. And I think personally, my time is better spent looking into what really is the military industrial complex, which is the Silicon Valley, the big tech. This is the current battlefield. These are the weapons. So I think when we, when we look at big tech and the reach that they have into our lives. This is something that we can't take off the table. A lot of the things that I have read over the last week since the event have said a lot of, you know, conspiracy theorists have one thing in common. I don't call myself a conspiracy theorist, but these people who, you know, are are analyzing this outside the box, they have one thing in common and that they don't watch television. And that is definitely a start, but you have to be very careful about what you're accessing online. Because when you're watching countless hours of video, you are, you are being programmed with a point of view. And everything that you look at has a certain plausibility to it. It is plausible that the Secret Service bungled. It is plausible that they were in on it. You know, that it is plausible that they knew nothing about it. It's, it's a, it's a, a tunnel from which there's really no return. You can just get lost there. Is, is this, are we headed towards civil war? 
I've just read you what I think about the level of weaponry, both from Carl Quigley's opinion in the 1960s to my opinion about how war is really waged in, in large part on our minds. And the, the battlefield really is no longer television. It's the Internet and our social media and the different devices all tethered together where this is being played out. So you've got to be careful, and you have to choose how you spend your time. And for me, I'm not saying I want to be unhinged from any connection um, to other people, but I long ago simplified the questions for myself by putting politics in the box of something created as a distraction, not at the top and not what's really running things in any country. Again, show up on the 27th at the Telegram Book Club site and participate in the discussion if you'd like. And take care, all of you. And uh, don't forget to support if you like what I'm doing. If you want to get Alan's books or discs, support. Um, I do use Stripe. Um, and that's... But I don't use PayPal. <laughs> I don't use PayPal. All right, take care. Have a good week. Hi, folks. I'm Alan Watt. And this is Cutting Through the Matrix on August 13th, 2017. What are the different versions of reality which become the different versions of history down the road, looking back? And I've mentioned it before, we get the accidental view of history, which is the view we'll have when you really believe your indoctrination that somehow we just bumble and stumble along through time, uh, making all kinds of crazy decisions and suffering the consequences and so on. And that's just the way it is, and that the money goes up and down like a yo-yo, because again, people make the bad decisions, or outsiders make decisions that have got nothing to do with your government, but your government goes along with their big massive investments or losses or whatever it happens to be. That's the accidental view of history. Things just happen, and we don't, we don't see it coming generally. Or if we see it coming, we don't really think they meant it, or, and on and on it goes. In other words, that's the authorized view of history. When it becomes so apparent to too many people uh, that things aren't just happening through accidents all the time, and you point out coincidences, there's too many coincidences, to leading up to certain things that happen without being stopped. When you could have stopped it so many different ways along the, the different path, the actual path it took. And it doesn't happen. So you, you say, well, people must have known. Well, they did know, and so on. Why didn't they stop this from happening, and so on and so on. Everything is basically planned that way, deceptively too. So there's two views of reality which become history down the road when you look back at things. You also have another view of history, and that's the very few who help plan it all, who plan the future, which becomes the history looking back. They actually plan it in such a way, and they tell you about it too in their own big, big, uh, massive, thick books and so on done through the last century and a half maybe of how they're going to bring in the system of world, not just governance, but it, it, governance it brings in all aspects of human existence. Everything to do with humanity is encompassed inside this idea of a global society. Everything from the ethnic groups to the future, to the mixing, to the taking down of certain types, the breeding up of other kinds and so on. This is really human farming we're talking about here. And a completely new way of living in such a slick way that most folk don't even figure out that it's happening. They simply walk through it in a, a sort of hypnotic state, thinking it's all obviously natural because it, it's happening. Therefore, it must be natural. And that's how simple it really is. 
But there's also another, a fourth group of those who actually see it, who are not in on the planning, but they see this happening, and they've got the hardest time of all trying to convey this to other people. And I've said many times, I've come out and said this, that when I first started, I didn't come out to change anything in any big drastic way. Because I, I was completely aware of this system we call reality, which is incredibly huge. There's thousands of think tanks working on every aspect of our existence. And you think you're going to change all of that just by pointing it out? It doesn't matter what you point out. People go along with decisions according to whom they trust or to who understands the, the, their psychology better. That's why fear and, and terror is a, is a great tool. It's always been used. Stick with us and you'll be all right. That, that's, the, that's the old, old slogan, basically. So it's not a matter of just telling people, but there are those who see it from an early age, and, and they turn on themselves often. Everything's wrong. They know it's wrong. And they turn on themselves. And I came out to try to stop that from happening. It's very self-destructive. Because you don't know all the facts at the time. You just know it's all wrong. And the things that you can see are wrong. And, and the, things, the few things that you can point out to other people, it's a stunning effect to realize that most folk don't care what's happening. Or the, the injustices. Isn't it astonishing how many movies that they put out there? And believe you me, the storytellers in Hollywood know exactly how to turn on the tears how to turn on the anger, all kinds of emotions. It's so easy, simple formulas, but it works so well. Even from cartoons, they can do it, for goodness sake. And one of the greatest things that they'll see in a movie is they, they've got to have justice in the movie. So the bad ones, get their, they get their comeback on them. And there's always justice. It's a natural thing. But in reality, even though people crave it, it doesn't happen in reality. And it doesn't happen in reality. And uh, this is the thing, most folk don't care. It's not odd that. You want to see it happen in the movie, but not in reality. In movies, you'll find they're put together in formulas. They're all formulaic. And it's easy to get the, the, the viewer to become involved in the characters in an intense way, very very quickly. Because we've only got about an hour to an hour and a half to get you involved and get the whole story out from beginning to end. So they have a way to, to really get you involved in it and you get to like the characters or you might even put, identify with the characters yourself. And some people overly do it in fact. Some people really, really get involved in movies and start yelling at the screen. You probably heard it. What happens is you're, you're involved. So because you've been so emotionally involved in a very fast, intense way in an hour and a half, you want something done. So you expect justice to be done, in fact. But in real life, it doesn't work out the same way. You don't have that intense, sudden push to be involved as you were in a movie. And therefore, it's much easier to let things go as your day-to-day -day problems continue. Because you're always going to get problems in life. A lot of them happen anyway, but enough, an awful lot of them too are, are foisted upon you by the system. You, you're constantly told that everything that really matters for your survival is out of your hands. That's really the message behind it all. All these unseen hordes of people that manage this strange thing called money that's never stable from one day to the next, never mind from morning till night. And you'll have little of it. They'll have lots of it at the top, the people who manage it all. Because they're the con artists, of course. Because the whole thing is a con. Quite, quite simply, it's a con. Of course it is. And because it's a tremendous big con, believe you me, you don't tamper with the characters at the top. Because in the real world, it's better than any movie, in a sense. Because it's much more vicious than the movies. It's way beyond any of their ratings for, for viewers and so on. They deal with you rather quickly in a whole variety of ways. That's the truth of, of the, the world for those who, who still want to believe in the, the nice system of democracy and rights, etc. Nothing's further from the truth and reality. And that's the sad part of it, too. When you look at, for instance, the whole idea of free trade. Now, free trade came out of the one organization, I've mentioned it so many times, 
Lord Alfred Milner, who wanted to develop a British Commonwealth world system, that would be all worked together and working together under unified central authority. Then it set up an American branch, naturally, because they, they knew they'd have to get a much bigger, wealthier tax base to pool um, the money from for the future. They're already, they were ex- already exhausting Britain with all the foreign wars and so on. And they had to move to America, to the U.S., where you had a massive population compared to Britain, and you also had tremendous resources and so on, lots of work, and you could tax the people for a long, long time before they became bankrupt as well. But that's what the whole idea is about. And out of world wars, they eventually put in the uh, United Nations building in New York, uh, which is the, the big empire state, the world empire, and uh, you, you'll find this also where uh, as the financial capital of the planet. And from there, of course, uh, they, they manage the whole amalgamation of nations into first blocks, and then eventually you'll be into your global governance system. It's like to call it, they like, they like to use the word governance. They don't have to actually declare things, you know, and say, oh, we're all one now, and blah, blah, and here's your parliament. They do want it, of course, but that will come anyway, down the road, through conflict and through other things in crisis that they'll cause and bring on. It's quite easy to make things happen when you've got the incredible power to make it happen, either financially or through war. The two things combined are of what incredible power there is in the world. They can crash economies so easily. They can get uh, billions of people, if need be, pleading to their governments for help and assistance if they wish that to happen. Or they can bring you all into a war and bring you down that way. Or they can do it in many other ways to bring you down through uh, making you all sterile. Not all at once, so that you're, you just die off suddenly, but enough, enough in every generation to, to bring it down. And of course that has been happening too. But, as I say, you, you really got all these different versions of reality. And people do choose which ones they want to believe in. There's not a person in the world will think of themselves as being stupid. People get awfully offended if you really call them stupid. They'll be sane, that if they saw psychiatrists and so on, they'll all say they're, they're, they're sane people with their opinions, but they haven't got a clue outside of their television newscast as to how reality really works, or what's really, really happening, or why things really do happen in the world. They don't know. They think they're completely informed. They have lots of friends who also watch the same newscast and, and get their reality from that and think this is what's happening and here's why it's happening and so on. And the, the ones who really, really believe it all, and there, there are people who really believe it, that's the shocking part of it, the people who believe everything they're told. And, and why not? I mean, whoever grabbed you by the, the, the shirt collar and, and shook you when you're young and said, wake up, here's reality. Here's reality. Don't believe all that nonsense. Here's how things work. No one does that. And if your parents accept it as all normal, so will you, unfortunately. And that's what the big boys at the top count upon. You'll find books talking about the need for a world war, for, which became World War I, years before it happened. You'll find books between the two world wars talking about the need for a second world war. And you'll find books, too, uh, saying that out of world wars, if they can get them, they could bring a United Nations, a world parliament, to manage everything. But they would need the conflict to make it happen. Now, there's no mention <laughs> in these about the incredible misery and slaughters that world wars would create. It really didn't matter to these big people at the top, these planners. It really didn't matter at all. And the same planners were so boastful about things, they admitted they belonged to an elite class, almost a different species, you might say, a different breed, or creed as well, I suppose. But they really believed that they are so superior. 
And some of the writers got carried away like H.G. Wells, and he believed himself that he was, he belonged to this elite club. He really believed, even now, when he gave talks at the Fabian Society, and his high-pitched voice, people used to laugh at him. That's why he left it eventually, but he was all for global socialism, which in its true form meant complete, as we've been talking about for years, managing us all individually from birth to death, no free choices in anything, a planned society, which is working today, in fact, in many areas. You know, there are, <laughs> there are people, because of, of the, the chaos with the take down the family units and so on today, and this incredible growth, which again was forecast a long time ago by the big planners, the growth of social agencies, giving government approval, even though they're private agencies really, to have power over the lives of both parents and children. You'll find that there's children today in the U.S. and elsewhere who are so used to, to the social workers, they, they call them by their first names. They've grown up with them. If they have a problem in life, they call them before they'll call anybody else. Because they see them as relatives, like auntie and aunt and uncle. That's how bad it is today. But don't ever think that anyone with a paycheck from the government is your aunt or your uncle. That's the beauty of it. It's like a sci-fi movie, isn't it, where the aliens are managing the planet. <laughs> That's how you kind of see this kind of thing. But they've trained the people not to see them. As they really are. That, that's how the world is run. You have batteries and batteries of, of scientists of all kinds working with the, the global elite. And you can go back into the writings of the, the secretive societies. Yeah, and yes, they have secret societies or societies with secrets as like to do the little play on words and semantics. But you can go into the alchemists. And the alchemists wrote about it, saying that they were learning the powers of basic, it's really basic chemistry is what they were going into. And they believed that governments would eventually come to them, to their little cabals or guilds, and leaders of, of nations and kings would have to come to them for their secrets, for power. Because secrets of, of anything really to do with science gives you power if you can use things, even weaponry, of course. And they believed that eventually they themselves, being the, the literate class, you might say, would eventually become the power over societies, the scientific elite. All beginning, as I say, with themselves and alchemy, etc. Alchemists, too, were basic chemists, and they... They also sold things. I was reading, for instance, about some violins, the Stradivarius and so on, and the tests that they've done to try to find out why they were so, the, the tone is so beautiful in them, very unique. And there's a few reasons, but one of them too was, was also to do with the finish they used on them. And th- th- this fellow was saying that the makers would, uh, didn't make up some magic potion, they would go down to the local a uh, guy who was basically into mixing all kinds of things together, the precursors of the chemist, you might say, and that was the alchemist. And you would buy the stuff off them, and you'd follow the instructions he'd, he'd, be, he'd give you, and then you'd, you'd apply this finish, and hopefully it would give you what you were after. And that's how they did it. So some alchemist had the formula uh, pretty well worked out in a good form, and... Uh, Somebody made an awful lot of money off selling good violins. Of course, it's more to it than that, too. It's all to do with the wood and the way the wood was soaked so so long in the water, etc., etc., etc. Floated down rivers and even kept in water in the log form, etc., etc., etc. There's an awful lot of etcs, of course, in the making of anything to make it really, really good. But the point is, you definitely had what they called the underground stream as well, where they formed these little clubs and, and groups and had their, their secrets. And, of course, even for the public, they give a lot of nonsense to the public, thinking they were kind of magical stuff involved in the mixing of these potions. 
but in a way that added to their mystique to an extent and, and gave them more power in a sense as well. Folk like that kind of thing. And I think, well, oh, there's more. It's, it, it, it's the same when they're selling stuff today to cure you and things. You know, you take an ordinary thing and then you, by the time you're finished with a good salesman, this thing will cure you of anything. This, this, whatever it happens to be, could be grass clippings for all you know. But by the time it's finished, you'll pay the earth because it's going to cure you of everything. It's the same kind of thing too. That's part of the mystique which uh, they used to call magic. But today is good chronology. But that leads right back into what I'm talking about, to reality and the versions of reality. People will choose the version of reality they want to believe in. Naturally they do. And with psychologists and all the behaviorists, etc., that you'll hear this term they're always using uh, in their in their talks, like what we'll see what investment you have in this particular area, meaning a psychological or emotional or whatever area. It's everything to do with investment. So it's, it's, it's broken right down into basic, basic, the usual stuff: uh, greed, simple greed, and want, and all the rest of it, and desire. And that's what they call it, investment, and uh, that's how they work out. How to manipulate, in fact. Unfortunately, a lot of it's true. In other words, if you truly are, you're a human being, but you do share a lot of common things with other creatures, like the mating instinct, things like that. These all can all be used, amplified, and used against you as well. They can all also be used to weaponize a society, to destroy the society in the family unit, which has happened as well. It's all perfectly well understood by the boys at the top. Remember, the ones at the top work in generations, many generations. That's how they plan the future. And they work it right down to how many folk they even want around in the future to service those elite people. They keep using the the, the nonsense of democracy or republicanism, which is absolute nonsense, because we've never had it. I really don't think we've ever really had it. As soon as you came up with the idea, there are those who are ready to work and use it for their own advantage, unfortunately. And that's how the world really has been for an awful long time. You can't get honest people to stay honest once you get them into government positions, especially when you've got intergenerational, lifelong politicians. And they're in it for life, and they'll never meet a compromise that they don't like especially when it benefits themselves. And in other words, it's corrupt. And it's so far removed from the ordinary people that, again, it's like another creed or or breed as well, they're so separate from the ordinary people, they have very little in common with them at all. But the way to rule the world into a version of reality is always, as I say, through fear. Again, financial collapse, joblessness, starvation, the threat of war, and so on. Fear is the biggest thing out there to use. Even pharma companies, big pharma companies, I watched a documentary, it was sent to me a while back, on big pharma and how they push the, va- the various drugs that they, they push on the people and get round <laughs> so many different restrictions on themselves to even get ads out there and so on to get the people to push to have these particular drugs prescribed to them by their doctors and so on. A, a tremendous, massive, big business in psychology is to make this all happen. And really, when you, when you work it down to, to these particular drugs, so many of them that are used daily now, very commonly, they're completely unnecessary. You create a problem that, that often doesn't exist. It doesn't exist at all. And one documentary was awfully good. I've seen it years ago too, and again recently, and it did go through how, I think it was called The Men Who, who make, make Us Spend. The Men Who Make Us Spend, I think. They go through how the, the, uh, the history of the big pharma companies, and one guy back in the 50s maybe, could have been the 40s or 50s, said that the, the problem with pharmacology is that only sick people need medicine. And he says, it's a shame we can't train the people, basically, to use medicine all the time, even when they don't need it. Well, they've come up with uh, many ideas of to, to make it so, just that so. And they come up with a lot of things which really don't exist. And many fudged studies, of course, come down to say, oh, you really need this because well, your cholesterol's up or whatever it happens to be. 
and some of these documentaries go through this whole process. And very well done, and they stick to the facts and the data that's out there to support their claims and so on. But what I'm saying is, is that that's how that's how you spend as well. It's through fear. It's through fear. Without fear, you won't spend your money on the stuff that they want you to spend it on, which is their business. And so you must always create fear and make them spend it and they'll hope that they'll survive anything that comes down the pike. It's the same thing too with, with the constant uh, threat of war. Then folk can be sold, follow it, shelters, you name it, they'll, they'll buy it because they get really wrapped up in it too. And there's many organizations out there that use various means of propaganda to make you buy everything under the, the sun including the kitchen sink and a sustainable version of course but what I'm saying is everything out there in, in the f- area especially of media and electronics is geared towards shaping you into something other than an individual thinking independent being that's the enemy of those who want to sell you things they must shape you into into a different kind of product. And that's what you are, your product. Bernays, again, who's often given the title of the father of this kind of indoctrinated propaganda and advertising, wrongly too, although he was a big player in it as well. I mean, he was, he was well trained in it. It existed before him, long before him. But he was trained in how people really, really work in crowds and, and, uh, and so on. The mass character, in other words. And he was a nephew of Sigmund Freud. And Freud was also into the subconscious idea that most folk work on almost unconscious impulses and emotions are just sitting out, out in the fringe there somewhere outside the realms of consciousness. So if you understood them, you could make them want something, make them buy something, make them do something. And to an extent, they're, they're quite right in, in that way too. Again, the simplest way is fear, uh, of course, but also you, you can make them want things if you if you attach the product with even sex, anything which is a primal force, basically, uh, that, and of course reproduction is definitely one of them. So you attach so many products with sex, and it gives it, make, it changes it from being a simple whatever it is to to a different kind of product altogether. That's why it works so well. That's also why they, they, they show you so many ads for food or, or chocolates or ice cream. Uh, again, with a, a, a quite dishy looking female sitting in a, in a comfortable place, almost purring like, you know, and, and, and that's how you buy stuff and it's all attached to something else, something else. But it's the same thing too with primal fear of survival and death, uh, fight or flight. And you can turn, you can switch them on. So, so many industries are left actually. <laughs> are all involved in making things for survival. Even chintzy things like, like fast, fast erecting tents and things like that. Things that won't last very long, actually. But anyway, what I'm getting at too is that everything out there, especially in the realms of, of media, uh, are to do with altering your opinion of thing, on things, altering your perception on pretty well everything, and using you using you as a tool for either buying a product or influencing other people for a political campaign, things like that. Sides, always creating sides, so many sides on everything uh, that you'll lose yourself in the process. Once you start losing yourself, it's easy to see people who are, other people who've lost themselves, they can't stop talking about their favorite politician or whatever. I don't care if it's left or right, it's all the same to me because it's all the same game. Politics is a game, and really, the things that happen are planned anyway, doesn't matter who they put in. The rest of it is drama. It's a drama, it's a soap you're watching. That's what it is. Because the big military industrial complex is always at the forefront of pretty well everything, along with academia, which is part of... Eisenhower talked about that too. He he didn't talk simply about the military industrial complex and... Uh, seeking power, etc. But he also added he, he, in his talk uh, that academia was on board with this whole big power agenda as well. 
And we understand that the system they want to bring in is not democratic, and it is not based on some kind of basic loose form of republicanism either. It's a different system altogether they're bringing in. Then you should really be on alert because it's nothing that's sold to you as been a, you know, for you to, to, to understand consciously. In fact, it's so heavily disguised, it doesn't want you to see what it really, really is. The best kind of slavery for the slave owners is the kind of slavery where they don't know they're slaves. They don't know it. In slavery, you used to have to have overseers who would stand there and watch the slaves in case they ran away or whatever it happened to be. But then they would also have to feed them. That's organization again and manpower. And then you have to get clothing for them and so on. And sometimes basic medical care and things like that too. And that takes away from the profit of the owners. It's much better to put this thing called money in and let them earn so much and then they can feed themselves and clothe themselves. And if you manage the system and work it out very carefully and you own the money system, they can make sure you're getting actually more back from them uh, than you were getting before when you actually had to give them clothing and so on. You can get back through taxes and get back through, uh, you control the product prices that they have to buy anyway. It's quite quite easy to do. And that's how the elites in the big think tanks sit and discuss all these things all the time. They take it all quite calmly, what I'm, being, I'm talking about here, very calmly on a daily basis as they work upon basically managing all of us like a big herd and how to maximize the profit. Remember, too, something else that Bernays said. He says, don't, don't, to, to the salesman, don't go out there and start from scratch now, if you want to sell something uh, like a political party even, because you sell political parties, you sell politicians, that's what you do. He said, don't go out and start from scratch, going door to door and start talking, arguing and all the rest of it and informing. He said, look through the phone book to at existing organizations, right down to churches, which are your favorite ones. Get a meeting with uh, the, the, the guy at the head of the church, be awfully friendly with them, give him a few bucks, in other words, in the right direction, and he can then lead his flock along the path uh, that, that you had asked them to, to go along. It's much easier. In other words, they're existing organizations. Never forget that. Never forget for an instant, because if you belong to any organizations, believe you me, you're wide open to be used. Without ever knowing it, because they don't come out and tell you, oh, by the way, we're, 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 we're commandeering this organization for this purpose. Uh, and here's the opinions you should have from now on. They don't do it that way. They do it so slickly, you will have those opinions very quickly, and you'll think that they will believe that they, they are your own. It's quite easy to do. Bernays also said that for those who create actual things, like, like lawnmowers where it happens to be, don't try to simply live on your reputation. Because at one time, uh, manufacturers had to make good products in the 1950s and maybe 60s. And word the mouth got round awfully quickly and folks said, oh, I bought this thing and it didn't last long, but that would spread like wildfire and people would stop buying it, you see. So he says, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't tell them how, because ads at one time would come, would come on and the guy would tell you why you should buy this product. He would tell you. Not, he wasn't selling you a dream. He was saying, I'd buy my lawnmower because it, it's very good on gas. It lasts longer. It's, it's made with good ball bearings and, and the engine and so on, the races and yada, yada, yada. But not now. Nothing sold as in a product today. It's all sold as an emotion. Whoever it happens to be has got nothing to do with the actual product. Nothing. And that's what he said too. He said, rather, rather, and this goes for selling you politicians as well, and political parties. Bernier says, rather than make good products and sell the good products to the people, he said, change society to suit your product. Think about that. Awfully important. Simple little statement. And look around you. Look around you. Easy to do.
What do you hear? A product can be sustainability or the greening agenda, whatever it happens to be. Look around you and how many folk you, what's environmentally friendly? You got all these buzzwords and buzz terms and phrases all given to them. What was, what did Lenin say? He says we should win by slogans. Repetition, repetition, repetition. It works wonders, it works so well. And when everybody's saying it, because they'll say anything that they're taught to say, then it must be correct. And it must be true. And that's how you, you receive it. So easy, isn't it? So easy. So you, yeah, you change society to suit your product. And they do. What you're selling, what we're selling environmentalism and the greening agenda to bring them into austerity and to make them easily managed in a very, in a very poor lifestyle as we change society from one system to the next system for the next, the next few hundred or thousands of years. That's how you do it. And you give them a good excuse, a good reason. Again, based on fear. If you don't do this, we're all going to die. <laughs> it works wonders, isn't it? Eh? <laughs> you see, the old slave owners used to hire basically thugs, thugs that didn't mind bashing folk and whipping them, people who couldn't fight you back. Thugs. Today, they employ think tanks with, with very official sounding names to make it more, because that, that's how we're impressed being little people. You see, we're very impressed by official sounding names and You'll notice too with your governments today, they all farm out to these private organizations for ideas. Oh, we need to do this. What do you suggest? Then they pay them, these private, org- these are the people who are ruling you. <laughs> the, the rulers get paid, all, the, all these different organizations, they get paid by your tax money via your governments to do the things that your government should would do in the first place without farming the work out to them. Uh, everything's public-private partnerships now. So private organizations rule your lives. And it's really down to what appears to be a handful of them, but they're all connected to the same organization at the top. And I've spoken about it so many times over the years. You just keep falling over it each time you turn around. The ones who came out with the big global agenda in the first place. Colonel Quigley said, they're bringing in a new feudal system. The feudal system is your public-private partnership. Because you don't elect these overlords. But he said the new feudal overlords will be the CEOs of private corporations. Look at all you hear about today. Oh, Elon Musk. Oh, Bill Gates. Zuckerberg. All these front men, and they are front men, who make their money of creating things that you all pay for. I don't mean things that they they sell you. I'm talking about whatever they want to sell you, you pay the money uh, through billions of dollars in tax money to, to fund and create their organizations or their factories that they want to sell to you the products of. You pay for it all. Can you go to the government and say, give me a grant for a few billion? I've got a great idea. So you're not in the club, that's unfortunate. That's why you won't get that given to you. But these guys are in the club. Public-private partnerships, they're anything but democratic. Of course they're not democratic. And look at all the great, grandiose plans of these, these guys that are put out to you as being some sort of geniuses who come out of nowhere with ready-made stories of how clever they are. But in reality, there are big organizations behind them all. They're just the front men. To change the world. Remember what the Council on Foreign Relations said a few years ago? It's time that the big philanthropists, these big guys, some of them we just mentioned there, uh, would take the rightful place in governing the world. Really? Do you understand what, what they're saying? The, this Council on Foreign Relations, again, the private organization, <laughs> this is the American branch, basically, and Canadian branch of the Royal Institute for International Affairs, private organization for global governing or governance, as I like to call it. Think about it. It's awfully important. An amalgamation of blocks of countries into into trading blocks and then eventually under a world government. They've been quite open about it and honest about it. Interestingly enough, too, a few years ago, if you mentioned this to anybody, they'd have balked at it 
and balked at you and ridiculed you, but not now because of the little little bits they get here and there in dramas or movies or little bits and bites of and documentaries to do with it. They start to kind of believe it because they're, they're all getting conditioned to start to accept it and think it's all quite normal as it comes in. That's how it's done. As Jack Salal said, the philosopher, he says people don't learn by really studying anything or reasoning through it. It's more like osmosis. It, it, it just kind of comes across in little bits and bites through their, to their skulls through everyday working and, and little things, little quips they hear and don't take much notice of consciously, but it gets, eventually these little bits and bites get through to them. And that's, and because they, they don't consciously think through it in a logical way, they accept it when it happens, thinking it must be quite normal because somehow it's all familiar to them. It's quite simple at the process. But yeah, public-private partnerships, feudalism, you're in it. You're in it. Don't you ever get upset and think, how dare they, how, how dare government or governments across the planet farm out everything they should be doing themselves? To private companies that specialize in running think the same things across the whole planet, some of them. And you still go and vote. Well, why don't just vote for these corporations then? Why not do that? Because the time is coming, obviously. And mind you, you, you can train the population. You really, really can train them to vote or even worship anything. You can do it, given enough time. Because... That the techniques of brainwashing folk are all here and they really do work very well, proven over and over again on most people. Not them all, but most people. Yep, it, it, it really is astonishing to, to watch what's been done even since, since the 1970s to the present day across the whole planet and to society and the structure and fabric of society as well. It's, inc- it's still going on, but it's incredible to watch it happening. And these guys were so confident, like Bretton Russell and so on, they were so confident they could pull it all off. So was Aldous Huxley. He talked about it with the techniques of, of, he called it techniques, scientific techniques. He was talking about mass psychology, very intense psychology and, and behaviorism techniques and neuroscience as well, used on the general public. He said that basically it could be frightening because it could be make them do things that they ought not to accept and do. And it's so right. But everyone out there is trained, oh, no, no one can make me do anything I don't want to do. That's why it works on you. You really think you're impervious to it. Now getting back to this, these articles for tonight, I'm telling you, uh, you don't get news anymore. What you get now is a kind of filtered drama from all sources, agreed upon at the top, the very top, is agreed upon, obviously it's agreed upon, to keep as much factual stuff away from the public as possible. And th- th- that was discussed many, many years ago to bring the public to this stage, where they'd accept being governed by all these different private agencies and, and, and social services, being governed, 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 and will take no real interest in how they're governed. That was all planned a long time ago. Most folk are not, really don't care. They're out there to play and to buy their latest plastic toy or phone, whatever it happens to be. They even want certain, even the guys want certain colors. This, these phones cost a lot of money, these iPhones and so on. Lots and lots of money. Bashley was in the documentary I saw a while back. They, they wanted, they, some of them were lining overnight to get the latest one the late, with the latest apps, but, but not for that. It's because it's a different color. What? Hmm. It's amazing. You know, when I, when I was small, most folk uh, in your towns didn't have phones. Americans could have them. But in Britain, no. Very few folk would have them. A local doctor might have one, uh, and so on. But most folk didn't have phones. Money was so tight. Now, in no time at all, they've got guys in queues, and some of them are queuing up to see a different coloured phone. What? What's happened to society? But it's just too easy to do. Now, here's an article here. This is from the old Neocon group. They have different newspapers, but one of them 
When I was uh, here to do with Afghanistan, Russia, and this is a little important thing too, a little bit's true, truthful. This is, there's a reason conflicts in Afghanistan go badly for major powers. In 1979, the 380 million people of the Soviet bloc went to war with the 13 million people of Afghanistan. After suffering horrendous casualties in 10 years of bloody Warfare, the Afghan rebels should have been ready to surrender, but the Russians were not aware that during a decade, that's 10 years of conflict, Afghanistan's already high war index had jumped from 4.65 to 6.53. Faced with that extreme drive of angry young men, it was a communist superpower that gave up the fight. The Soviets, with their falling birth rates, could not match Afghanistan's endless supply of military replacements and its unwavering willingness to fight. Now again, if you've done much reading at all, you'll find a lot of the characters I've mentioned over the years that turned out their books and talked about this very technique of literally, you know, breeding out <laughs> in order to fight an enemy down the road. Just breed up your, your stock or breed it down if you want to lose. And that's what's, what's been happening as well. And today you also have other bigger powers that through various means are making the men sterile too. That's not by, by coincidence, folks. It's not coincidental. So this is a, a common thing that's taught in, in military academies too about population and the drive, getting men to marry young and start producing children in a lot of countries, and in, in the, the constant estimating by the decade of what the population should be, if you can really push it up, etc., etc., and get the population numbers up. Can you win a, a long-term battle? They'll get taught that. Anyway, I'll put this link up. Just to, to tell you that President Trump, it says, has another Russian problem, because, of course, they're going to have problems. I can remember back in the, in the late 90s, on a show, I was asked about Russia and so on, and now that the wall had fallen, the, the Berlin Wall. And I says, well, I says, everyone will go fine until they, they want an, an enemy again, and then they'll revive the great bear, the big bad bear, if it suits them. And here we are. Because they always got to have an enemy. Even though at the very, very top of things, they really don't have enemies, even during the Cold War. It's quite interesting, too, that during the Cold War in Vietnam, you find that it was noticed by Americans and aerial photography and so on that the big army vehicles that were used by the northern Vietnamese uh, were actually uh, identical to an American company. And the reason being that the American company had a big factory in Russia. Russia was supplying North Vietnamese with these particular vehicles. That was a gas, it's called Gaz, G-A-Z company. But they're identical with the ones in, this, in a, with a corporation in the U.S. These things, would, they go on regardless of, of, of the pretended wars and so on for the military industrial complex. And back to the war nonsense again. But it says, are mercenaries really a cheaper way of war? And it says, the founder of Blackwater, that's a private company that, that uh, eventually changed its name to the Academy, I think it was, says privatizing the 16-year war could save taxpayer money to Afghanistan. So it falls in the last article, you see, because they're telling Trump that they have to get back into Afghanistan. So the founder of Blackwater says privatizing the 16-year-old war could save taxpayer money. History, both recent and further back, suggests a different outcome. And the world is sliding in a strange direction when a prince wishes to become a viceroy. This is a little play on things because the the CEO or the founder, sorry, of the, the Academy is Eric Prince. This is the founder of the Mercenary Academy previously called Blackwater who's been pushing a plan to privatize the war in Afghanistan. <laughs> the privatizing wars. Eh? <laughs> and we're taking it in a stride. 16 years, uh, my country's longest war continues to cost huge sums of money. $40 billion this year alone, and there's no obvious end in sight. Amazing too, though, because the, the, the U.S. is still providing troops and security for all the Chinese trucks that are taking all the minerals out of there too, I've read over the years. So it's big, big business as usual. Hmm? And many other things apart from just the minerals. 
Anyway, it says, it says so Prince, his, Prince's plan is for the U.S. to turn the war over to mercenaries, perhaps, say, the Academy, that's his organization, or, and to appoint a viceroy, perhaps, say, Eric Prince, to run the war. Uh, so it's quite good. And again, I'll put up this article, another one that says U.S. forces should acquire material and higher manpower support. It all comes out at the same time because everything is, is managed by big, big advertising agencies. They put all different articles on the same topics at the same time. So the average person will see from different sources thinking it, is, it must be real news. But in fact, you're, you're looking at a massive ad. That's what you're looking at. It's advertising and getting used to the idea. Anyway, Eric Prince is a former Navy SEAL officer and founder of Blackwater USA, chairman of the Frontier Services Group, a logistics company focused on Africa and South Asia. Again, he goes into the, to, to the, the reason they should privatize this whole thing. Also put up his, uh, wiki, of course, and you look up that for yourself as well. And then, what's also interesting is, is this article. But just to show you it's a small world and all that, you know, that uh, your democracy or democratic republic, however you want to call it, republicanism, is all working for you. It says Elizabeth De- DeVos, her name is, Elizabeth D. DeVos, is a, a businesswoman, politician, activist who is the 11th and current United States Secretary of Education. Member of the Republican Party, known for support for school choice, school voucher programs, and charter schools. She was Republican National Committee Woman for Michigan from 92 to 1997, and served as chairwoman for the Michigan Republican Party from 96 to 2000, with re-election to the post in 2003. She's right into the educational system and so on. Also for the lines for school choice and, and action institute, etc., She's married to Dick DeVos, the former CEO of multi-level marketing company Amway. They were the ones who really started off the pyramid minerals and vitamin stuff from Utah, I think it was. Anyway, and is the daughter-in-law of billionaire and Amway co-founder Richard DeVos. Her brother is Eric Prince, the former U.S. Navy SEAL officer, and he's the founder of Blackwater USA. Anyway, the divorced family was listed by Forbes as the 88th richest family in America with an estimated net worth of $5.4 billion and so on. November, President Donald Trump announced that he would nominate divorce to serve as Secretary of Education in his administration. Small world, though, eh? Everything comes together at the right time for those who, you know, yeah, those who are around you perhaps or maybe even help you, who knows? There's also an article too by Paul Craig Roberts, who's, I don't know how, he's, he's further left than, than maybe Trotsky, but, but he, he's also writing a lot of things too. But he just mentioned that Trump will now become the war president because he can't get forward with any help from the administration, so he's got nothing left except just to basically cave in and become the war president. That's how he's spinning that one. But personally, I think that it was always the, on the cards that Trump will be the war president for across the Middle East, what's left of it, and finish off some of the jobs there too, obviously. And he's also promised to deal with Iran and so on for interested parties. I'll put up a link too to show you that most countries aren't really caring about this nonsense from North Korea. It's a red herring, it's a diversion, Well, other things are actually really happening as we go along here. Another another few articles are put up too from the Council on Foreign Relations and the CG Group, which is just another CFR group in Canada, basically that helps to run global governance as they, as they talk about it. This private organization advises the governments what to do. But anyway, this is four ways new US sanctions change the world, showing you how they, they can put sanctions on different countries that can bring countries down, make them uh, obey, etc., whatever they want them to obey. And this is countering America's adversaries through Sanctions Act. So it levies new economic sanctions on the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is the only country that doesn't give us any problem right now, and the Russian Federation and Democratic People's Republic of Korea. <laughs> Korea. 
you know, if you don't see China worrying about Korea, then we shouldn't really worry either. And Japan isn't bothered either. So I'll put a, an article up where you, 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 there's diplomats and so on talking from those countries. And they, they think it's all hype and nonsense and a diversion, which of course it is. And also, another couple of articles to tell you what economic sanctions actually are, how they work, etc. And then, this article here. Child miners age four living in a hell on earth so you can drive an electric car. Awful human cost in squalid Congo cobalt mine that Michael Gove didn't consider in his clean energy crusade. It's quite good, actually, to show you the, the, the hype and nonsense about the biodiversity stuff and uh, how clean the energy is and yada, yada, yada. You wouldn't believe the massive squalor and, and the filth that's left from making all these different things to do with electric cars, etc. Now, the truth on free trade... It's free trade, it's from big international corporations, again with uh, the, the big guys that you, you know their names and so on, you'll build them their factories for them and you'll pay for it all and you bring roads in, you'll pay for your townships will pay, your provincial governments will pay and your federal governments will pay to put them up in business. Trump's incredible deal to have Foxconn spend billions of dollars in southeast Wisconsin won't break even. For 25 years, it's, it's standard free trade. This is free trade, folks. This is what was all signed into law years ago, where they come into your country and your governments will use your tax money, billions and billions and billions of dollars, for these private corporations to set up. And believe you me, you aren't going to get many jobs out of it either. But so it'll take at least 25 years for Wisconsin taxpayers to break even to lure Taiwanese electronics giant Foxconn to the state, according to a fiscal analysis. And I'll put that link up for you to look through. Also, I mean, uh, there's quite a few articles about the Foxconn factory because they make some cell phones too. And we mentioned in the papers for mass suicide or lots of suicides that they're working. Because it's really, it's really awful the conditions to make these folk work in. It really is awful. Mass suicide protest at uh, Apple manufacturer Foxconn factory. Around 150, 150 Chinese workers at Foxconn, the world's largest electronics manufacturer, threatened to commit suicide by leaping from their factory roof in protest at their working conditions and so on. Also, so that people in the West who are all brainwashed now and completely altered beyond recognition can queue up all night long to buy the latest phone and get a different colour. Oh dear, dear, dear. Isn't that sad? Isn't it really sad how easy it is to change and manipulate society? Isn't that really amazing? It's kind of scary, isn't it? But I'll put this article up. And on the border, Foxconn in Mexico, from, that was from 2015, to give you an idea how they, they worked there too. Remember too, under free trade, and the free trade racket is only for big giant corporations so that they get set up in your countries, uh, using your tax money, and they, you pay for everything. And they take all the profit off whatever product they eventually start selling you. But they get given it all. It's not loans to them, they're given all this stuff. It's just astonishing, it really is, that people slept through this all happening, the free trade meetings and so on. And if you say, no, you can't come into this country, because they, they can demand to continue, even they can demand if they want to. I don't know if any of them done it yet, but they can bring in their own workers and, and say, well, we're bringing our own workers in, in who are simply on hire from our countries, and we're going to pay them below the wages you would get in your country, the minimum wages. Uh, if you stop them coming in, they can sue your government for billions of your tax money. That's how they did it across Britain for the, for the EU, by the way. So many companies that never set up simply threatened to go into these countries and set up with certain conditions. They were turned down knowingly. They know they'd get turned, and then they, they, they sued and they got billions for doing nothing. What a racket it all is, isn't it? Eh? What a racket. But you know, most folk don't even realize how vastly the system's changed in 20, 30 years. They've just floated through it all, thinking it must be normal. You know, the accidental, stumbling along view of history, when it was actually planned before they were born for most of them. And all the changes you're seeing now, 
were planned again before you were born. All planned. Cultural changes, everything. Migratory changes, everything was planned long before you were born. But yep, you're stumbling along down through history. It's all just happening accidentally. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Sure. For myself, Alan Watt from Ontario, Canada, it's good night. And may your God or your gods go with you.